This is Have You Met. My guest today is an extreme athlete and adventurer. His accomplishments include three world first records, walking across Mongolia, Madagascar, and the third longest river in the world, the 4,000 mile long Yangtze River in China. He's passionate about what he does and is an enthusiastic storyteller. He shares some of his numerous close encounters with wild animals, death, and much more, including even the paranormal. Have you met Ash Dykes? So, Ash, tell me briefly about your roots and about how and why you became an adventurer. Oh, it's a, it's a long answer. It's a very, yeah, are you ready take for your this? time. Take your time. <laughs> are you ready for this? <laughs> and so, okay, so, wow, the sort of background as to what led me to the path that I'm currently on. And, you know, I'll, I'll break it down a little bit. You know, I'm from North Wales and on the coast there in Old Colwyn, a very sleepy, sleepy and very boring town, in all fairness. <laughs> beautiful area you know we're next to the sea we've got the mountains the lakes the forests but it's a bit of a sleepy town you know full of old people and whatnot but uh, I went to a, a, my local high school and that was great I was more interested in the social life rather than getting the good grades uh, progressed on to college and did a, a sort of two-year outdoor uh, adventure course outdoor education mm-hmm. course which was okay. great but it was this course I think that was a little bit of the catalyst into the adventure realm. You know, I, it felt like I kind of found my, my niche and my passion for adventure. Uh, But not only that, I think most importantly, I found that I was a kinesthetic learner, you know, sort of learning from hands-on practical experience. And it was that course that made me decide that, you know, I don't want to take the usual path of university. I want to try to develop and, and grow myself through more experiences similar to that of the outdoor education college course and you know I had this wild idea to go out traveling the world and explore different cultures and traditions and get familiar with myself and test myself in certain scenarios but I was 16 you know 16 going on 17 I was taking driving lessons I was working in a fish and chip shop and I just thought how am I gonna you know travel the world and I just broke my goals down. I worked multiple jobs. I became a lifeguard. I sold my car. I bought myself a push bike. I met a friend who wanted to come traveling with me. And we were just grinding away 240 hours a month of work. I like staying disciplined as well, cutting the nights out, uh, not really treating ourselves. And eventually, you know, age 19, we, um, we left for travels, the first place being China. And I should also mention that actually before we left, We wanted to invest in ourselves because lots of people locally were saying, you know, it's all good going traveling, but your money's going to run out and you'll be forced Mm. to come back home. Whilst my friends would have cracked on with their university degree, maybe found work and, you know, I'd have been back to square one. So I invested in myself into into scuba diving and Mm. built myself to a level whereby when I'm traveling, I need to find work as a scuba diver so that I can top up my funds as I go. And, uh, And so we did that, ticked off all of the goals and, little boxes that we set out on this big sort of mind map on a piece of paper and and we left age 19 and then that's when it really started to become wild and adventurous from there wow so that first expedition at age 19 where like you said it's china but where and what exactly was the plan for that how long were you going for as far as you were concerned yeah so you know when i originally left to go traveling i had a big four-year plan to travel literally around the world and to, wow. to be a scuba diver and sort of kind of follow the seasons. I was interested in getting my uh, snowboarding or skiing instructor mm. course as well, uh, license, and so that I could be a scuba diver in the country where, you know, it's, it's hot and when the, when the skiing season is down and then I can be a, a skiing instructor, you know, in Canada, wherever, and sort of follow the seasons that way. But yeah. I left for travels and, you know, I was in China. It was me and my friend and, you know, it was a great time. We were trekking the Great Wall, sort of soaking up the local culture and whatnot. But it was only a few weeks in that we found we were very much on the beaten track. And this is not what we wanted for yeah. travels. You know, I would kind of watch, I kind of hear other people's stories and people who had gone traveling before. And, you know, my granddad's stories, I guess he was an absolute wild man. You know, he lived oh, in really? Pakistan. Yeah, he's, he's a very poor man, very educated man, but very poor and, he overstayed his visa. He lived out in Pakistan for 21 years. Um, wow. and, right, and right now he's in his mid-70s and he lives in uh, Jaipur in India. 
Um, and so he would come back and forth and tell me wild stories and, you know, even documentaries like the David Attenborough show where you don't want to watch it from the TV, you want to be out there amongst it. And so that was my idea of traveling. But when I left and I was in China, that wasn't what it was. You know, I was sharing the same photos as every other tourist. I was sharing mm. the same stories, the same experiences. We were on a little, a little shuttle bus on our way to the Great Wall, which was like a very fancy decorated part of the wall. I wanted to see the ancient part, you know, the untouched where there's no other tourists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was great meeting the tourists because, I, you know, I've made friends for life and you meet people from all over the world. That was the pro. That was the benefit. But that's not why I left. I wanted to, to meet the locals, you know, get to know their way of life. And so it was only yeah. two, two to three weeks in China before we ended up. We only skirted the surface, you know, just the East Coast there. China's a massive place. I remember just touching yeah. it and being like, we didn't really travel China, did we? <laughs> But we went on to Cambodia then, and you know we we messed up the currency, and we'd spent a lot more money than anticipated. And we were on it. We were on a majorly shoestring budget. And me and my friend Matt, we were we were sulking. We were bitching on the on the Mekong River Bank. You know, how did we get this wrong? We've spent so much money, and we're only four weeks into traveling, and we want to travel for four years. <laughs> and I remember just sat there thinking, Jesus, how did we do that? And then I said, like, look, we've not even done anything adventurous either. Yeah, we've trekked the Great Wall of China, but with a hundred of a tourist. So that wasn't really different. And I said, what can we do? You know, we keep getting these silly sort of coaches across mainland and sharing buses with everyone. I'm like, let's do something different. You know, let's let's get because because of the budget, you know, let's get a ridiculous bicycle that we can just about purchase. And, uh, and let's cycle. Let's stop taking the bus. Let's cycle across Cambodia and the entire length of Vietnam. And I was serious. You know, I was, I was serious when I said it. And Matt was like, he started laughing and saying, like, on oh, what bikes? And I'll never forget this part. It's so, like, stuck in my mind. We just heard this screeching noise. It was perfect. It, as he said, you know, like, what kind of bike? We just heard screeching horrible sort of ridiculous noises like a rusting noise and anyway i turned around and there's this tiny skinny sort of frail old lady cycling on this, <laughs> this the handlebars were that tiny and she was cycling on this ridiculous bicycle and it looked like one that we could we could afford and i said look let's let's get two of those bikes you know i don't know let's get two of those and let's see what happens and it started off like a little bit of a, a joke um kind of kind of i was serious but i didn't think we would get such ridiculous bikes but we did you know a few hours later we had this this bike i named mine elder because it was like a little old lady's bike my friend <laughs> named his dot and um they had no gears <laughs> they had no suspension a little hard seat they had like a little pink <laughs> bell the handlebars weren't straight handlebars but they were tucked in like that um we took no pump we had no puncture repair kit we had a five pound non-waterproof tent and we found string on the side of the road <laughs> that we used to strap our rucksack onto the back of the bike with. And that was it. No map, no technology, just a camera. And we were about to cycle over 1,130 miles all the way to Vietnam and all the way right up north of Vietnam to, to Hanoi. Um, and we did, you know, and this, I believe, was the actual catalyst to the adventuring life. We were chased by dogs. We were hit by mopeds. We were dodged by lorries. The bikes broke about 17 times in total. You know, they weren't cross-country bikes. They were little bikes yeah. to take the old lady from her house to her work, which was about a mile away. They weren't made for a thousand plus miles. And uh, the locals were amazing, though. You know, they really helped us and fixed the bikes. And, you know, we just had such a mega experience. It took us over two and a half weeks. And by the time we made it, we were exhausted because we got to Hanoi. I think it took us... I was awake for over 45 hours. I think it was a wow. visa issue where we cycled all the way through the day, all the way through the night, all the way through the following day in like 40 degrees Celsius. The mosquito spray of the night had mixed with the sunscreen during the day and turned our skin blue. We were living off noodles, so we were very skinny, not, not a good <laughs> diet at all. And, you know, our hair was sticking up. We had flies trapped in them, and I remember it cycling for 39 hours straight. And when we finally arrived, we were turned down by seven guest houses and hostels because we looked ridiculous we looked like we were on drugs so the locals were like you're not you know you're not staying here um but then you know we found a place we slept and that was a huge highlight and i remember at that point i was like 
that was amazing. You know, I want to, I want to continue with these adventures. Wow. That's so, wild. Yeah. So you, like did a thousand miles on a legitimately shoestring budget bicycle. Yeah. 10 pound. Um, it cost, it cost us 10 pounds for those bikes. <laughs> it's good, good value for money to travel yeah, the length of Cambodia. Right. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Very good. So you're sitting in your hostel with your buddy and you're, you're thinking, I love that. How did you like? Where did you go from there? How, did you did you want to get straight into something else? Were you like, okay, we need to chill for a bit, like on a beach? What was the what was the thought process there? Yeah, we were like, I always had this vision, you know. I was like, ah, oh, can you? I remember saying to my friend, you know, can you imagine at the end of life, sort of having a world map in your living room, and you've got these lines where you've walked across these countries, or cycled, or sailed across this ocean you know and maybe i don't know maybe that chat did something but right now in, in my bedroom i've got a map and there's lines all over the place you know already and i've still got a long and a lot of time left but at that point i remember thinking you know what can we do next um and from there we headed over to thailand and we were actually in north thailand just sort of skirting along the jungle right up north of pai which is sort of northwest and i remember seeing a local guy with with a machete um, and a bandana. It was kind of like a Thai Rambo. And he yeah. came over to us and his English was okay. And I remember him just like saying, you know, have you ventured into these parts of the jungles? And we were like, no. And he said that he does a thing where he can take us to a Burmese hill tribe where we cross the border and we were like, we don't have a visa. And he was like, that's fine. <laughs> we crossed the border. This was in 2010, you know, when Myanmar was closed down to all Westerners. And he says, we'll cross the border, we'll venture into Myanmar, and we can like learn sort of survival from a Burmese hill tribe. And straight away, I was like, wow, that yeah. would be mega. Um, yeah. And, you know, a lot of people wouldn't trust that, you know, some random Thai guy with a machete inviting you into the jungle. But um, me and my friend, we, we, you know, we were willing to go with it, risk nothing, gain nothing, right? So we were like, okay, <laughs> let's, let's try this. And it was an incredible experience. You know, we did go for a hike. We did cross the border. We were in Myanmar. We stayed with a, a, a Burmese hill tribe for a good few nights. And they were teaching us how to build shelter using natural resources, how to build rafts, how to hunt and gather sort of berries that act as uh, a mosquito repellent and oh, all wow. the things that bamboo can be used for, which is an incredible amount. In fact, the Thai guy that took us loves bamboo so much that he, he named his son bamboo. Oh. Um, yeah it's his favorite plan and you know it was just an incredible experience and that was another adventure that sort of increased my passion for doing these things so it wasn't necessarily about cycling countries or, or hiking countries it was more about the experiences with the locals and really sort of soaking up the local culture and, and their way of living that I was really fascinated by yeah has it changed how you look at the world a little bit, like all these different cultures and languages and people and, you know, different different traditions that you've come across? Uh, you know, it must really allow you to see things differently. Yeah, it does. And you know what? It's, it's so exciting because, I don't know, a lot of people say the world's a small place and, you know, everyone's been everywhere now. But I found that the more that I've traveled, the more I've realized that, gee, you know, that it's a big place and there's lots of diversity. You know, I reckon they only say it's a small place because they are on the usual track. You know, they're still in that mm. minibus going to see the Great Wall of China, whereas you've got to, you, which is amazing. I'm not, I'm not mocking that, but you've got yeah. to get off that path, and then that's when you'll be shocked with actually how beautiful and big and very little traveled as well. I guess some parts of the world are, and I just love yeah. meeting with the the with the locals and just seeing there. You know, everywhere I've gone from Madagascar to Mongolia. Uh, you know, to West China, they're just living completely different lives to even when I was on my early adventures to, to the people I came across in Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar. It's just, uh, oh, it's a beautiful world. I do love it. Yeah, amazing. Um, So you were, you started off and you, you, were, you were in China, you did Cambodia, you were loving it, you were loving the lifestyle, you wanted to keep doing that. Um, in between that and I think Mongolia was the first of your, your three kind of bigger, yeah. bigger expedition in between that and Mongolia, like how, how much time passed and did you ever doubt what you wanted to do? Did you ever think, oh, maybe I should go and do this instead? Or was it just always, no, this is, this is my life is what I want to be about. Yeah. You know, I, 
always from that Vietnam cycle, I'd always want to incorporate adventure. But at that point, I never knew that it was possible to earn money through adventure. So mm. at that point, it was just sort of, in my mind, I was kind of happy to live life as a poor man, but, you yeah. know, travel around and, and create these experiences. For me, it was all about lifestyle more than the money. But then, you know, I, I was working as a fruit picker in Australia and, you know, I was working for a small amount of money and you know after australia trekking the himalayas which was another amazing experience i realized that my money is running low and i would have to focus on better means of work and you know that took me to thailand and i became a scuba diving instructor for the next two years and even the money there was it wasn't great you know i was always counting the pennies so whilst mm. i wanted to live this adventurous lifestyle i didn't know how i how long i could live it for and of course, I didn't even know of the possibility of becoming an adventurer and earning money this way. That yeah. wasn't, uh, I kind of had an inclination that it could happen, but I didn't think it could happen to someone like myself. You know, I come from a, such a very normal background. I don't have no military experience. I don't come from a financial background. I didn't even go to university. And I guess the adventure industry has been hit hard really by, you know, sort of the posh boys um leading expeditions or joining an expedition because they've got that extra money and whatnot and i kind of thought that that's them that's not me so i won't be able to do that kind of thing um, yeah and that's what i i like about you know how organic it it happened really you know i had to really work hard and even in in thailand the scuba diving it wasn't a lot of money you know so i would i would fight the locals in the martial art of muay thai uh, yeah. to pay to pay my rent you know <laughs> if you lose a fight that's it you go home with nothing but if you win <laughs> it's probably enough to to pay two or three months worth of rent because it's so cheap how in often Thailand. how often did you get it paid for how often did you win <laughs> i got it a few times i never actually lost a stadium or club fight um, oh, really but i did lose spars you know because then they would put you against people who have been doing it for a lot longer and you'd take a beating um <laughs> And so I got it paid a number of times and enough probably awesome. to last me a good seven, eight months worth of payment on the, on the rent. Yeah. Uh, and so that was good. And, and it was fun and I enjoyed it, to be honest. It's not like I yeah. had to do it, um, but it, it did, it did matter. I remember just like my wages as a scuba diver and just checking to see if I had enough money mm -hmm. to go over to the next island and celebrate sort yeah. of the, the full moon party, you know? And I just yeah. remember that I didn't want to be like that. I was like, this is good for now, but I realized I don't want to be on that path where I am skimping it just because yeah. I love adventure. And so I had to put the business mind on my, uh, you know, on my shoulders and then think, how, how can we, how can we do this? What other options are there? Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I still, even at that point, I knew that it was a possibility then that you could earn money from it. I just did not know how I would go about it until yeah like what, what a gift that must have felt like for you you know like when you found something that's your passion your hobby and and you know something you love to do with your time and then when you kind of realize oh actually i think i, I can get paid for this like that's, that's such a cool moment yeah exactly and it happened at the right age as well because you know so if i was in my um early 30s or early 40s and then i realized you know i can get paid doing this i would have to go at least a good few years um with earning nothing from it to build up that experience you know which is fine you know it's no you're never too late to start but at that point i guess i had youth on my side you know i was only 22 when i started planning mongolia and so i didn't have in my mind then i didn't have the whole settling down and you know earn lots of money and retirement plans that for me was nothing because you never guaranteed tomorrow i was just living for the now and, and planning little steps to set me up in the future um but i was thinking at least a decade from from then and so yeah uh, yeah, age, wow. age helped for sure. Leaving at 19 rather than the whole university route for me. It's great for most, yeah. great for a lot, but I just feel that we all learn in different ways. And, and I think it depends, yeah, on how you learn yeah, and, and what exactly. you want to do as well. Like if you yeah. want to become a doctor or a lawyer, obviously That's go to path. uni. Yeah. Um, but if you're not really sure what you want to do or you want to do something, you know, like more creative or more like, like you know, adventuring or something yeah. with YouTube, uh, whatever it's going to be, you don't need it, do you? It's yeah, just gonna, that's it. It could, for some people, it could be a waste of time and money. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. So, so you didn't go, so you decided to travel the world instead. I, I kind of, yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly that. So the, 
the three big expeditions then if i can call it that because it sounds like cambodia was pretty big and like i'm sure again there's there's loads of other ones but would you agree that mongolia madagascar and the yangtze are the three the yangtze river in china are the three yeah biggest? definitely yeah they were world records so they sort of yeah. dwarfed any world of first world first yeah so they yeah. dwarfed the previous sort of early adventures um even though they were so great and and they actually without them i wouldn't have achieved these three records but yeah these were definitely my biggest three yeah yeah okay awesome i mean i don't think we got time to go into all of them individually and like go in detail as, as we could sit here for 10 hours and chat about them yeah but like let's start with which was the hardest of the three like why and and i guess the the reverse like what was the most enjoyable or the easiest the the, the most fun and and why yeah. like, what were your thoughts on comparing them have you compared yeah them yeah I have, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's a hard one because they came in stages. You know, for me, I think mm. the Mongolia trip was the most daunting. You know, you you put them together and you would assume actually the Yangtze, because it's 4,000 miles and it's going to take 352 days to complete, and there's a lot more challenges. But for me, I had never done anything like Mongolia before. Uh, the only big expedition, or it, not even expedition, the only adventure that I had had, had been with a with a friend of mine. Had been with Matt, and yeah. we'd always been on roads where there's people, where there's food, where there's water and shelter. Um, and it was only short, you know. Uh, so I never really got to face loneliness and and real threats or challenges. And so the fact that I was now about to attempt Mongolia, and then I started doing research because I didn't know it was a world first to begin with. It was only when I started to reach out for those people who had done it before so that I could ask them for tips and advice. I was just doing it for the pure love and passion of it, you know? And then when I started to bring teams on board, and when I say that, I couldn't afford no teams. They were actually volunteering because they thought it was a cool project. Um, you know, so I was speaking to the Royal Geographic Society. I was speaking to fixers and logistics managers on the ground in Mongolia too. And, you know, they had found someone who had attempted it and claims to be the first person ever to attempt a solo and unsupported hike across Mongolia's length. Um, but he failed on all three attempts. I think it was either just before or just after the halfway point. You know, I remember looking into this guy and he was a, a soldier, a desert explorer. He'd already crossed um, the Sahara Desert with a caravan of camels. And I was a 22-year-old beach bum living on an island. <laughs> you know, I was like, I was not a soldier and I'd never been to a desert before. And that almost yeah. put me off. You know, that did almost put me off. I had a lots of mental blocks and barriers and doubts, you know, people, I started to speak to, to people who had been to Mongolia, you know, and could offer me any help or advice. And these people who had ridden on horseback, like a thousand kilometers across Mongolia would laugh saying that mm. the horses struggle to cross the country. What hope <laughs> do you have alone? And they said that the nomads, obviously the past thousands of years crossing, um, crossing the country, but they say that they've got, you know, they've got, uh, battering camels they do it as a support group as a network of family and friends they just kind of thought I was reckless and stupid and that kind of put those thoughts into me and I thought maybe I am reckless and stupid maybe look for a more populated country but um, you know I, I I believe that just because no one's found a way to do it you know it doesn't mean it can't be done with the right training yeah. and preparation maybe I could be the first so that put the stakes really high and and that put my sort of thoughts and worries and you know, I was scared of Mongolia. They were saying that you're going to yeah. face a pack of wolves. You're going to come across stagnant water, drunken nomadic drifters, snow blizzards, sandstorms, steep ravines, and that most sort of hauling journeys uh, fail. I think it was like 90% of hauling journey, you know, when you haul the, the trailer behind you, fail. So that's the odds majorly stacked against me already. Um, yeah. You know, and I do remember testing the trailer in Scotland and it did break. I had to call for backup. Um, and that scared me again, even more for Mongolia. I just had major fearful thoughts. You know, I tried not to doubt myself, but it's too hard to do when you don't really know what you're capable of. You know, I hadn't faced mm. being alone before. I didn't know if yeah. I'd be able to motivate myself or if I'd make the right decisions or if the loneliness would freak me out and the vulnerability. And if a water well was dry, you know, and my fight and my flight, you know, I didn't know how I would react to all of these scenarios. So that's why I was fearful. So Mongolia, yeah. definitely for the mindset. Madagascar, probably for the physical demands. You know, Madagascar was 1,600 miles, took, took 155 days to complete. And out of those 155 days, I don't believe there was one 
pleasant day's trek. I oh, honestly really? don't think there was a day that I could just, you know, set up my tent and be like, oh, that was a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Not that they were bad, but when you face challenge after challenge, you kind of look forward to having a bit of a break. You know, maybe it's just a, a flat meadow that you could just trek all day and then camp up. At. But no, it was mountains. It was cyclones. It was spider bites, leeches. It was hunting, hunting and gathering. It was getting lost in the jungle. It was carrying a chicken called Gertrude. It's being held up at gunpoint by the military. It was almost losing your photographer to a nighttime river crossing. It was crocodile infested rivers. It just goes on and on and on and on. <laughs> And I don't think there was a pleasant day to hike in. So that may be for the physical attributes. And then China yeah. again for just the duration, 352 days and losing 10 members within the first few months and the bears and being stalked by wolves and minus 20 and over 5,000 meters altitude and being pulled in by the police and being threatened of, that you'll be deported. And so all three, I really cannot... Pick one. I think if I had before, so straight after Vietnam cycle, if I was to look at all three, I would say, yes, the Yangtze is the hardest. Um, and that Madagascar and Mongolia are kind of joint. I kind of knew that Mongolia would be mentally tougher. Madagascar would be physically tougher. Maybe I wouldn't because I'd be pulling a, an 18 stone trailer across mm. Mongolia, you know, maybe that's the demands. But I think with Mongolia, it gave me the confidence to take on Madagascar. And then when it came to China, I had so much experience that I wasn't that fearful because I now knew myself, unlike Mongolia, yeah. when I just didn't know myself and how I would react. That's a big answer. China, <laughs> it's, it's a good answer, though. It's a good answer. So China, I guess, was less what physically and mentally demanding, but just longer, basically. I think China would have been more physically and mentally demanding. But I think it's thanks to the experience of Mongolia and Madagascar, I was able to manage it in China. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So going back to those two, I guess let's kind of skim in and just take off a few highlights and things like that. So talk yeah. about, to start with, like you crossed the Gobi Desert, right? In, in Mongolia, which is a massive yeah. desert area. Mm, that's it. Um, how lonely, like what was your loneliest point in Mongolia? And like, what was that like? And th did you kind of nearly go crazy at any, at any point, like uh, with your own thoughts? Like what was that yeah. whole thing like? Yeah. You know, it was three weeks over the Altai Mountains. It was five weeks across the Gobi Desert. And then a and that's all alone. That's all alone. The only time I'm not alone is the, is the locals that I bump into along the way. Yeah. Um, so I never saw, did I see any? I didn't see one foreigner in the whole journey. It was only, you know, because it's very sparsely populated and not very well traveled. It certainly wasn't in 2012. Um, because I think it only opened up to Westerners properly or made it easier, like in 2008 or maybe just before. Um, and so yeah, I think the longest period I went was over eight days without seeing a single human. Wow. Um and I kind of told myself that it's so rare that you can travel such long distances for such a long time and come across no one. And so I told yeah. myself to, it reminded me, it's like a dinosaur age, you know, like in a world yeah. of, you know, so many people you know, to not come across one person in that amount of time over a week. It was surprising. Yeah. So I tried to tell myself to enjoy that. Yes, you feel vulnerable. Yes, you feel very low. And you kind of feel it's on you, you know, no one's going to help you. There's no one here. If something happens to you, no one's going to know. They'll just find your corpse in the future, <laughs> you know. So I was very aware of that. Um, yeah. And so I did, yeah, I did get lonely at times. I think the times I got lonely is when, of course, you know, there was the loneliness of not seeing people, but it was definitely mixed in with the hunger and dehydration. There would be times where the hunger would send me into frustration. Um. The loneliness, you know, it would make it acceptable, acceptable for me to shout or scream out loud to myself, <laughs> like for the hunger, lack of food. And then the yeah. dehydration as well. It just, you know, created that angst, that annoyance. And so all of this combined made for a pretty lonely experience. But I knew why yeah. I knew the source as to why I was feeling like that. And I just had to focus on the daily goals. Like, you know, these dark times haven't come to stay. They've come to pass, you know, saying that I've always said on the on the adventures just last longer yeah. than the dark times that have arrived. Um, but yeah, luckily there were times where I was able to enjoy it as well, you know, and, and just just be in the moment. And uh, yeah, there were good times too. 
Yeah, that's important because it sounds like there were lots of like intense times, stressful times, yeah. hard times. Uh, but it's good to have good times too. What were, what what would you say your highlights were then from from that from from the Mongolia trip? I would say you know one big highlight is when I finally cracked the routine. You know when I first set off and said bye to Agban, uh, my local um, sort of a local that I was staying with at the start line before I set off for my journey. You know, when I said yeah. bye to him and I started to walk, everything was unfamiliar. Sleeping, it was so windy that the tent was so loud. I couldn't get much sleep. I was still working out a proper routine of when I like to sleep, how long I, I like to rest for, what times my I would take in the food, how fast to walk, you know, and still judging and getting familiar with the weather and what I need to wear in order to be prepared for snow blizzards or sandstorms, rainstorms, a lot. So I was still finding my routine. And I think one of the highlights is when I just somehow cracked it. I always call it breaking into your wild side. I think we all have that wild instinct to us. Uh, it just takes a while for you to really see it. And I say it takes about two weeks. And after two weeks of being uncomfortable, of being on your own or being out there in the wild, you know, everything's unfamiliar and you're cold and you're wet and you don't like it and you've got blisters. And, but eventually you toughen up physically and mentally. And you get comfortable with being uncomfortable and it all becomes a little bit more familiar, making it slightly more easier. And there was just a point of that at Mongolia where I was just like, yes, you know, I'm, I'm on it. I don't know what I'm doing different, but my routine just seems on point. I'm covering good miles. I, you know, I'm emotionally stable. My mindset is still intact, you know, and that was a huge highlight. But there were many. The yeah. locals would always bring, the locals always make or break a journey, I found. Um, and on all three of these expeditions, maybe apart from the south of Madagascar, uh, the locals have just made the experience even better. I remember turning around one day in the Gobi Desert and just seeing this this guy on horseback sort of galloping towards me from a distance. It's all flat in the Gobi Desert, so it took him forever to get to me, but you can see a cloud of dust in the distance. And it's quite intimidating at the same time because you don't know why he's coming at you. You don't, you don't know who he is. Yeah. And you do know about the, the drunken nomadic drifters sometimes they're kicked out of the goo by their wife they're angry they've got a bottle of vodka and you know their their natural sport is wrestling and they're big guys and so when he was galloping over i was just making sure that i was ready and aware and, and alert um yeah but it wasn't for that at all he saw me from the distance and he wanted to give me like a takeaway chai like a takeaway tea for, for oh, the wow, journey yeah. he came all that way just to give me some fluids wished me well and, and galloped back and that was a that was a massive highlight as well and just yeah. the nighttime skies as well when you're on your own and, and you're like, wow, what am I doing? Sometimes it just hit hit me, you know, the whole world first and walking across Mongolia. And, you know, when I was there, it would just hit me and I'd be like, this is a mad experience. You know, <laughs> this is so mad. Yeah, no, it does. It sounds amazing. I'm, I'm very jealous in a lot of ways, but also like on the other side, like, wow there's a there's a lot of, it's quite scary right at the same there's time a, yeah there's uh, a lot of stake yeah for sure it gets <laughs> yeah it gets sketchy i heard you tell one little story I, I don't remember the details but you had like an unexpected visitor in in mongolia like outside your tent or something like that i remember getting a, a few chills here and you tell a, a little bit about yeah. it well, so tell me this story in uh, again in full yeah there were some weird moments um in the gobi desert but one of them was where i just hadn't seen anyone or anything in I'm sure it's about five or six days up to this point and the last time I saw a wild camel was about four days ago you know that's the only thing I've seen <laughs> right out in the Gobi Desert if you see no camels or if you see nothing but camel carcasses then that's when you start to worry and you start to look how much fluids you've got yeah. left you know um yeah. but I was sleeping at night and weirdly I woke up to almost footsteps and breathing outside my tent and i remember listening closely making sure i'm not screaming <laughs> and I, it did i could just hear these they were heavy footprints as well and in my mind they were a footprint of a man you know uh, or of someone of a person outside my tent mm. and then the occasional heavier breath uh, and i remember you know were you freaking out at that point were at that like, uh... at that point i was just aware it's like everything switched off apart from hyper react yeah yeah you know and I remember every single movement was like millimeter by millimeter. And I managed over a long period of time to get my knife and, and a torch. So I sat in the tent, torches off. 
I was sat in my tent, I've made no noise. I've got my knife in my right hand, torch in my left. Um, and then I was just listening and listening and listening. And then I started to think everything that it could be. And when's the last person I saw? And I was like, no, it has been over four days since the last wild camel. You know, I've not seen a person in like six days, five, six days. And my mind was just yeah, overthinking as well. And anyway, yeah. I, 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 I worked the zip so you couldn't hear it, you know, bit by bit, one <laughs> zipper at a time and got it to a point where I could then slowly open. And then I shined my torch. And as I shined my torch, it was coming around, you know, it was like, oh, <laughs> shit, what? How's it, oh, how's it going to reveal itself, if you like? And it was like, it was um, a wild dog or a semi-wild dog. And it was a big dog as well. But it wasn't aggressive. You know, I remember thinking like, yeah, okay, it's a dog and I'm relatively safe. You know, it would have been worth yeah. it. It's a guy or a group of guys or whatnot. Um, and I remember it just circling my tent for a while, sniffing around, and then it fell asleep down near my trailer. Uh, yeah. So I was comfortable, you know, I did the zipper down and weird experience. Uh, but yeah, I, I fell back to sleep again. And then at five o'clock, yeah. five or six o'clock, I think it was five, I woke up to it barking at something and then it ran off barking mm. and that was my next concern I said, yeah we're in the desert what did it see you know what, <laughs> what's it barking at what is yeah, it barking yeah. at? So, even yeah. not in the desert even in like in my flat when my dog starts barking in the middle of the night <laughs> exactly. what's going on even the aliens are here or somebody's yeah. trying to break in and <laughs> so, something's happening yeah, man. Um, yeah but yeah that, that would that would make me shit myself after that experience for yeah. sure yeah it was so um, weird what about some of the highlights from Madagascar and, and lowlights, like whichever kind of come to mind, some of the memorable moments, I guess. Yeah, there was a lot with Madagascar because there was so much that happened. I do forget a lot of the stories in Madagascar. You know, with yeah. Mongolia, there were a lot of sort of days that you were in your own headspace. You were just hiking, you were covering ground. And whilst I probably did forget a lot of cool stuff that has happened in Mongolia, you know, typically when you're in the desert, that's it. You've got five weeks. Um, Obviously, the low light in Mongolia was almost losing my life to, to heat, uh, heat stroke, heat exhaustion. But after I made that and cracked on, it kind of like three different chapters, the Altai, the Gobi, and the, and the, um, the Mongolian steppe. But with Madagascar, oh, there was so much that I faced. Some of, you know, some of the, the low lights, of course, were being held at, up at gunpoint. Um, yeah, so what happened with that, just briefly? So I was always warned not to go down south of Madagascar, but I guess I was reckless. <laughs> and I, I was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm a man of my word. I said, I'm going to trek. It'll be, this will be the second world first, south to north, via the interior summit in the eight highest mountains, you know, along the Madagascar Ridge. Um, and so I needed to go down south. But there were shootings down south. The, the bandits are rife. The bandits were sort of, rock up to communities, um, cause havoc, steal zebu, which are kind of like their cattle, walk to the other side of the island and sell them for a lot more money. And so they'll make money. Um, but they're so much more efficient than the military. And because the military are always drunk and drinking, the bandits are able to overpower the military. And then not only do they do them over, they leave with the artillery. So the bandits mm. now in Madagascar have better artillery than the military. And so I didn't want to come across either <laughs> the military or the bandits. And I, I uh, heard word from a local sheriff that the, the military were making them their way down south. So I kind of utilized the forest area um, to stay hidden from the military. But then I heard that the bandits are in the forest because they're also utilizing it to hide from the military. And so I thought, I don't want to face the bandits either. So I exited the forest and we were met by the military and it was mainly just this one officer who was really aggressive, you know, really drunk. Um, and he had this, this AK-47, you know, he was lifting it up. He was demanding for the passport. But as it was like that, the strap on his shoulder kept slipping off because he was drunk. Uh, and he kept catching uh, it nearby the trigger with the barrel, you know, still up pointing at me and my guides. Mm. And so that was a worry. And then that built up a bit of a crowd. And so now there was a, a crowd circling us. Um, I think 95% of the crowd were on our side and didn't like the military. They're not very liked down south. But there were a few members that didn't like me and they thought I was I was French. 
the French have got a bad history in Madagascar for when they ruled over 60 years ago. Um, they were apparently quite brutal. So they saw me, they assumed I'm French, and some of them were trying to break past the crowd to fight me. So I was like, oh, God, I'm being held up like a boy. I got these trying to fight me. You know, and I, I, I remember staying, I remember telling myself, you know, don't do any quick movements. You know, yeah. just just go with it. Listen, stay calm, stay cool-headed, um, pass over the passport. Uh, you know, eventually it did cool down. The aggressive guys got pulled away by the locals who could see that I was trying to be decent. So that helps. I think that's why they pulled him away. He was like, hang on, this guy isn't causing any harm. And then the military yeah. officer eventually was slapped over the head by the other officers. Um, they still asked for money for their morning coffee. You know, they still, it was very corrupt. They still asked for money, but yeah, I didn't care. I gave yeah. them a bit of money and they cracked on. So that was the issue down south. Um, you know, and it's very difficult life down south. You know, there's a lot of sort of malnutrition going on. Um, there's wells, which are on the beach which means it's slightly filtered salt water that they're drinking. Mm -hmm. There's not very many crops that grow. There's no fruit, vegetation, nothing like that. They actually eat cactus fruit that their bellies have adapted to over time. Um, wow. And so, you know, they're very desperate and that leads them to sometimes act irrationally and, you know, try to kick you off where you're camping and say that they own the land just so that they can get money. They saw me a little bit more as, a, as an ATM machine down south, but... Yeah. I under I fully understood why, you know it's it's, yeah. it's a it's a tough tough life. Whereas up north there is more vegetation, there's more plantations, you know they're slightly more wealthier, um, and so they were just amazing and more welcoming because they weren't in such a difficult place like they were down mm -hmm. south. Um, but yeah, I faced a lot in Madagascar. Of course, I I caught the deadliest strain of malaria. There's there's four different strains of malaria. Um, I always kind of see it as a pro and a con. The deadliest strain, yes, you can die within 24 hours. That's the biggest killer. But it's actually the only strain that you can eradicate fully out of your system. So I, yeah, I don't... You take that. Yeah, you know, so I was With like... With hindsight, obviously. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Like now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, if you, if you can get it out of your system, if you can clear it out, then, oh, yeah, that's great. Whereas the three lower strains, they're not as deadly. But they right. can poke their ugly head back every now and then, you know, and you've still got it yeah. it's in your system. So I wasn't really educated when it came to malaria. Of course, I was taking my anti malarial pills, but it was when I came to a small community that this was triggered. I came to a small community, and this community was suffering with the bubonic plague, you know, such an ancient mm. disease, but in Madagascar, they still suffer with it. So we were told to stay in our tent. So we were in our tent. We weren't cooking. The locals would bring over food, and, and they did, but, you know, that meal, it was rice and eel, but the eel was slightly off. I, I mm. you know, it smelled a little bit funky, but I wasn't 100% sure. And I was starving, me and my guy grew. So we eat it. And the next day we crack on, we say, thank you, bye. I'm, I'm suffering, you know, I'm vomiting slightly. I'm suffering with diarrhea. So I think that the pills, the anti-malarial pills, bearing in mind, they only cover you up to 80%. We're going in one way, out the other way. And that's how my, the malaria was, you know, managed to get a grasp on me. Um, Makes sense, and yeah. of course I didn't make it within 24 hours. You know, I had that malaria for five days. I was still walking. Um, and so I do believe that there was that anti-malaria pill still working. Otherwise it would have killed me within a day. And then yeah. by the time I reached, you know, where I needed to get to, I just about made it. The doctors had only potentially a few hours before slipping into a coma. So, really? yeah. So, a close so call. were you feeling the symptoms physically? Were you like really yeah. sick and, and yeah, for days. tired and everything? Yeah, and weirdly, it was similar symptoms to when I was in the Gobi Desert, uh, suffering with heat stroke. You know, I was mm. just delirious. I was hallucinating. My organs felt weird. Um, yeah. Like in the Gobi Desert, I could almost feel my organs drying up due to the lack of water, you know. And, but I was shocked because I was like, no, I wouldn't make the same mistake twice. I have been drinking a lot of water in Madagascar. So what, you know, what else could this be? Um, yeah. And then I started to get worse and worse. And then, yeah, to the point where I was at the, uh, I made it to the city and reached the doctors. Yeah, I just collapsed on the bed. It was just all spinning. I just saw two heads pop above me. Um, they were giving me pills and they took my blood and they came back and, and they said, you've got the, you know, you've got false parum. And I was like, what's, what's false parum? This was all translated to me, of course, because they didn't speak English. Um, and they was to try, kind of stressing to me that's the is the deadliest strain 
of malaria and my heart just sunk i didn't know what that meant i was just yeah it, yeah. it sounds bad i was just like that sounds bad That's you, you didn't reply like what are my odds or anything you didn't want to get <laughs> you didn't want to get that wrong in yeah, like it, uh, the translation barrier it was exactly almost that yeah it's just like uh, be, be careful with what question i ask next because it's yeah, going to make or break just... me just be really nice and smile to them and uh, <laughs> please help me please fix me yeah yeah and luckily you know Scary. unlike mongolia i had better insurance in madagascar and my insurance was great you know i was able to translate they got someone who spoke malagas on the phone uh, and they were able to converse and you know we were taking the phone back and forth and they explained it to me in good detail and you know and then i was a little bit you know i was like wow okay so like just remember just checking with her so i can clear this so after seven days, it's not going to be my system. And she understood a little bit of English. She was like, yes. I was like, right. And then I checked that with her. Can you confirm this? <laughs> oh, I just hated yeah. that thought. Because I thought wherever I go, future adventure-wise, malaria can just creep up on me at any point in time. And I didn't yeah. like that thought. No. No, I'm not a big fan of that thought either. Yeah. So you're quite within your rights to not like that thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll, that I'll was, you know, that. that was only what, one month, I think one month into a five month expedition. So oh, I did really? all of that training yeah. and preparing back at home and I lost 13 kilograms. Did it mess, month. did it mess with your mentality at all? Did it? Did at you first think it did. Like, yeah. Yeah. At first, you know, when I was on those pills and I was just in, I had to be in a hotel not of the doctors because I still had malaria. So if a mosquito bit me and someone else and they've got malaria. Mm. So I had to quarantine effectively. And yeah, um, I, yeah I remember I, I went through a dark phase, you know, only lasted a few days, but I, I hated everything. I hated, I started hating on the country. I started hating on the look, which obviously was not me at all. That was the medication. Yeah. Uh, hating the people. And, you know, I was, I was good. I still had four whole months left started on hating yeah. on all of the challenges that I faced and I'm not even halfway through, <laughs> you know, I think I was overwhelmed with the amount that I was hit by, you know, I, I think mm. it was two weeks before I caught malaria. I had to run from a bushfire, you know, it was just, it was never ending. And of course the military yeah. gun, all of that happened within the first yeah. month. And when you feel like shit physically and mentally, but when you feel like crap, when you've been through something like that, everything feels worse. Everything yeah. feels harder. Everything, yeah, just feels yeah, ten exactly. times shitter than it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, you know, I had people on the phone as well. Of course, my family, they were there saying, I was going to say, like, what are you doing? This isn't a cold or a flu. Yeah, this yeah. This is the biggest killer in human history. Come back and then try again yeah. next year. But I was like, no, I'm. How in... hard was that to say no? Oh, it yeah. was pretty easy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I believed I was in safe hands. You know, I thought I'm in yeah. Madagascar. It's rife with malaria and they know how to deal with it. I come Plus back, I've had it now. <laughs> and I've had it now, you know, but you can actually still get it again and again. That was the scare. Yeah. That's what yeah. I did. And I tell you, whenever I hid a mosquito around me for the next four months, I was fully aware. I was killing it. I was like trying to get rid of it. I just, the damage of a mosquito is absolutely To be fair, killed me. I'm like that. And I've never had anything to do with malaria in my life, but I, I just hate mosquitoes. I have a vengeance against mosquitoes. Yeah. Just that noise. It will wake me up in the middle of the night yeah. like with a start. Yeah, you know, yeah. in a cartoon where you just sit up directly from lying down. <laughs> That's like me. It yeah. could be 3 a.m. And if I don't find that fucker, I will, will not be able to go back to sleep. Oh, just because I, I, I get such a horrible reaction from them. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know. And they're worse no, here yeah. than in the UK. And obviously they're even worse out in these exotic places. But I think I, I'm convinced they're worse here than back home in the UK. <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, <laughs> sorry you mentioned one of my pet hates so i had to jump in on that yeah anyway let's briefly um let's briefly touch on your highlights and i guess again like maybe low lights if you want on yeah. the yangtze um i know a much longer expedition um we're not gonna be able to give it the time it deserves none of these are getting close <laughs> to the time they deserve uh but yeah like any any things that stand out any memorable moments yeah i would say it's it's weird, isn't it? Because there's lots of highlights throughout. It was never ending with highlights. But for me, it's the challenges that really stand out as the highlights. Yet it sounds so negative when I talk about them because they are dangerous. But it's it's funny. I don't really, it sounds crazy me saying this because it's like over 7,500 miles the past few years. But I don't really enjoy hiking. <laughs> you know, the actual. That sounds funny. Yeah, you know, you know, the actual I, walking of it, it's, I'm, I'm more of your sort of action, man. I love the skydiving, the paramotor, the scuba diving, the cycling, the survival, 
you know, when I'm doing these Adrenaline. expeditions, yeah, what I love most is it's the magic that happens in between. Um, you know, it is the survival, the overcoming challenges, the meeting the new people, the exploring a new country, the trying the delicacies and, and just learning so much about the place and about itself. That's what I love. But the hiking is what gets you to places that are near impossible to get to by any other means of uh, transport. And so I do yeah. like the hiking for that, but I just don't really like it if it's just walking, you know. People are like, how do you train? Do you go on long hikes? It's like, no, I can't stand just going on a long hike. <laughs> Unless there's going to be a challenge, then I love it. And, you know, I say that because the challenges I'm doing so much from. So when I talk about these challenges now with the Yangtze, don't take them as negatives or lowlights. Take them as, as highlights because I do. Uh, whilst they weren't good at the time, they're good now. Yeah. Because they'll prepare yeah. me for what whatever's next. But, you know, some of the, the difficult times or times I've learned a lot from was First and foremost, the two years of planning that it took to get the green light for China because it's so sensitive and because I was going through 11 different provinces. Uh, you know, I needed production teams. I needed distribution companies. I needed to be made doctor, temporary doctor mm -hmm. for one year. I needed to have access oh, wow. and protection by the local authorities. I needed to have the government on my side. I needed 13 or 14 stamped and signed laminated documents to carry with me 24-7. And it took two years to plan all of this. Um, and it's a good job as well, because even when I was met by the authorities and they would take me back to their um, sort of government offices for questioning, they couldn't do anything. They threatened to deport me. But once I pulled out those documents, it's it's the government saying you you drop Ash back from where you found him and allow him to continue. So I was effectively untouchable for, by the by the authorities. And yeah. that's just something I never had on my earlier expeditions because you know especially the vietnam cycle and all of the early adventures it was just reckless planning but i knew that with china i couldn't do reckless planning because they would deport me within the first week and so that yeah. was a, a major highlight but also a major challenge the rest was like sort of avoiding the bears we were two and a half months late of starting the journey which meant the bears were now coming off the mountains because it's too cold and they were looking for food before their torpor which is kind of like their hibernation and right. You know, I, I kind of went with this healthy mindset of leave the bears alone, the bears will leave you alone. And the locals said otherwise and start showing me photos and videos. And saying, Look, this is what happens when the locals leave the bears alone. The bears don't care and they come <laughs> into the communities and, you know, they will attack. Um, and so that was scary. You know, I was very aware of the bears. You've got the Tibetan mastiffs as well, sort of safeguarding the locals and the livestock. Sometimes they were staked in the ground. Sometimes they weren't. Um, and that we, you know, often we would have to fight off these Tibetan masters. They are big. they're not friendly with you. No, they were kind of they're semi wild guard dogs, um, yeah. and they are they're bigger than wolves. They're so furry as well. They're like a mini bear. And so they were a threat. You know, the wolves weren't so much of a threat. I was followed by a pack of wolves for a couple of days, um, and I only found out. I found out six months later. Um, I'll tell you how it's funny how this story was. Was that out. in China? The, the 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 that that story. Yeah, this is China. Yeah, um, and you know, me and Kyle, my my videographer, were walking. We came across these Tibetan guys, and they were trying to warn us. We didn't speak Tibetan, so we didn't know what they were saying. They were trying to warn us of something, but you know, we were like, "Hey, we got that all the time." We waved by, but we Kyle had filmed all of this. Kyle had filmed the interaction between me and these Tibetan guys. And anyway, we pushed on down this valley that they kept pointing towards and kind of advising us not to go there. And for the next couple of days, we were followed by a pack of wolves. And, you know, it was, it was a little bit creepy, but mainly awe-inspiring. There was two of us. I never felt really in real danger. And the wolves in West China aren't as big as the grey wolves in Mongolia. But anyway, fast forward six months, my editing team in Beijing got hold of that footage. And what the guys were warning us, because she speaks Tibetan, they said, don't go down that valley because only yesterday a local lady was killed by a pack of wolves. And I had no idea. So we're, we're there like, it's great, great stuff. <laughs> Bye-bye. And they were, you know, maybe the same pack, maybe not. But the fact that I thought they're going to leave us alone, yet they had just killed a person was uh, maybe a little bit naive. But it's That's very wild. rare that happens, you know. It's like the extreme version of when somebody asks you for directions and you tell them it's down there and then left and they go the complete other way. Yeah. And these guys say, don't go down there. They're, they're, there's, there's wolves. They're going to kill you. you <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cheers, mate. Have a good one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was so funny. Oh, God. But um, 
Wow. You know, yes, <laughs> challenges like that, challenges like the snow blizzards and the and the the altitude being over five thousand one hundred meters. I lost guides to it. They didn't die, but of course, you know, they were they were abandoned or evacuated the expedition. Um, I lost film crew due to fear of wildlife. I think before month number two or three out of the 16 different people that joined me in terms of videography or, or guides 10 of those um had to go because of the challenges so i learned a lot there in terms of teamwork and scouting and who should join me who shouldn't join me um and yeah oh, it was just it was pretty endless the first few months it was like the first six months and the second six months were two completely different chapters the first six months were very survival based, were very out in the in the wild. I felt so vulnerable. Um, bears, wolves, the lot. Whereas the second half, it was coming across more locals. It was a warmer, more tropical environment. It was all of your foods, your herbs and your spices, your plantations, your vegetation, and and spending more time with the locals until eventually it was the mega cities in which I got a little bit sick of because I couldn't get off a tarmac road. You know, wherever the Yangtze flows, there's a tarmac road following it. Um, but it was amazing to be at the source, you know, far west near Tibet, where it's so narrow that you can step over it. And it's just this trickle coming out of the ground and then follow that for 4,000 miles. And where it pours out near Shanghai into the East China Sea, it's almost 10 miles wide and it's got cruise liners on it. You know, and I, it felt close to my heart because I'd followed it from its infancy and watched it grow and saw yeah. how much it feeds the population as I, as I go through uh, the country. It was just, yeah, amazing. Lots of highlights. Yeah. What was that moment like when you stood there and, and you've just finished that 4,000 mile trip, all the shit you've gone through and, and yeah, how was that feeling? Amazing. You know, it is amazing. It's weird not knowing that you have to wake up early tomorrow, get that big heavy rucksack on and carry on walking. You know, your body yeah. clock is stuck in that sort of, in, stuck in that way. But at the same time, it happened very gradual. It's, I think the best way to explain it, it's kind of not like, um, you know, like a racer, they're at the start line. Their finish line is in within, within 10 to 12 seconds away, you know, or nine, depending on how fast you are, you know. And they then find out if they've won or not, or if they've made it or not within that minute, you know. Whereas with me, because it's two years in the making and like visualizing and constant, and then a whole year of hiking, it gets to a point, probably about 70% of the way through when you realize that the hardest challenges are now behind me. So there's no, it's highly unlikely that anything's going to stop me now, which makes it difficult because in your mind, you've kind of made it. But you haven't because you still got to walk another 800 miles. You know, you still yeah. got to put in the groundwork. So I think when I finished, it was more like it's about damn time. You know, <laughs> it wasn't like a shock, like, wow, I made it to the finish line because I had yeah. lots of days by myself to mull it over. Like, this is happening now. This is, you know, yeah. I'm in the cities. I'm on a, I'm on a tarmac road. There's no way, unless I get hit by a car, you never know. There's just yeah. no way I'm not get into that finish line. it's like the going down the mountain part i guess like after yeah. summiting a mountain almost uh and that can be the most dangerous exactly. time exactly yeah like when you've just had your big celebration yeah and you're like, yeah we made it and then you you got to go down yeah and exactly there, i suppose that yeah it's like any walking or even running it's always like the last hundred meters which seems to be the hardest or the last mile which seems to be the toughest you know it's because mentally you've already made it but you haven't because you still want to finish that mile <laughs> yeah the brain the brain is weird yeah um, <laughs> so you you talked a little bit about the the bears and the wolves and stuff and and i mentioned earlier like we we have a few people on this podcast talk about animals and their encounters with animals and that kind of thing yeah so are there any other animal encounters that you can kind of go into now and and like tell me about um yeah there's been a few yeah um and not even just on the expeditions but even in scuba diving world you know, oh, yeah? yeah, yeah. There's this thing called Crown of Thorns. It's kind of like a. Do you, have you seen the Crown of Thorns? I'm not sure. I don't think so. It rings a bell, but yeah, I, it's I kind of like a, an image to it's it. It's kind of like a big starfish, but it's got spikes mm. on it, like sticking out, and it's a little bit venomous as well, a little bit poisonous. And <laughs> they just absolutely overpopulate. There's not a natural predator, and they kill all the coral reefs. So you're taught as a scuba diver, if you come across them, kill them because there's too many of them. They mm. don't have a natural predator. 
Um, and so I used to, and I remember this one time I was killing it, but the knife just slipped through its hard skin and one of its spikes just went right up through oh. and it snapped off inside me. Um, oh, it was so painful. But for the next day or two, I, I was pretty ill. And it was at that point I didn't know they were venomous. I came up because yeah. I was just a dive master, not an instructor. So I asked someone higher than me, are they poisonous? And he said no. And then two days later, I came back. And a different instructor was like, where were you? I was like, I don't know. I'd like eaten something funny and I was ill for the past two days. Um, and then I was telling him about that story with the crown of thorns. And he was like, you didn't eat anything dodgy. The crown of thorns is poisonous. <laughs> you, were, <laughs> you were poisoned, you know, for the past two days. So there was that. I've been bitten by a wild wow. monkey. Luckily, bitten by a monkey. I've been bitten on the leg by a damn monkey. <laughs> and it wasn't anything heroic like hacking through the jungles of Madagascar. <laughs> it was on Monkey Island in Thailand. <laughs> and I ran out of peanuts, oh, so it jumped up and it got pretty angry and beat me right on the leg. But yeah, you've got oh, yeah. that. You've got, luckily, I'd, I'd never faced a crocodile, <laughs> but we, there were crocs, um, croc infested rivers, or like rivers that had crocs in them. Uh, and sometimes we were unsure what was lurking beneath because the river was muddy. So we'd spend hours building a raft, you know, sort of flowing over the top. Oh, God. <laughs> Using nothing yeah. but bamboo and bamboo leaves to tie it all together, you know, getting the luggage across. And there was just always something nerve wracking about that. Just thinking that, like, some could be. Oh, I can imagine. Up or, yeah. Any little stick you see floating along the top. Like, yeah, oh, oh, no, it's a stick. Exactly it's a stick. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but. Yeah, what else is there? Spider bite. I've had a spider bite in the Madagascar jungle. A spider bite. Yeah, just sort of hacking through. How bad through. was that? It infected. It, it went pretty, it was kind of like bit me near my bicep and then again on my forearm. It fell down my top as I was sort of machete in hand hacking oh. through the jungle. And the same with the leeches. You know, most nights I would, you know, when I got into my tent, I'd take my shirts off and have to pull off, you know, a good, a good six to seven leeches and flick oh. them out the tent. Leeches were never ended. Um, Ah, and almost cool. rammed yeah, by a bull again in in India. You know, like like cows and bulls are everywhere in India. They walk the streets, and I was in a typical sort of narrow Indian alleyway, and a bull <laughs> went into panic mode and started to flip out. And of course, you know, its only escape was behind us, so we needed to run past us. And I just remember the locals shouting our way, and me and my friend Matt scurried either side right against the wall. And it just nudged us, you know, onto the floor. It didn't hit his head on and it carried on running. And yeah, so there's been some pretty wild encounters, really. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Did you ever see a bear? Because you had all these warnings about bears. Did you ever actually see one? Like, uh... Yeah, I saw a bear. Uh, I saw one bear in the distance when I was trekking. It was far away, though. I uh, didn't, re didn't really feel that threat, but it was pretty freaky that it was there. And at that point, there was yeah. three of us and a horse. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, that was... A, a, the beginning of China. Um, yeah. One that was pretty freaky is the local who was telling us about bears and how you know aggressive they are in these parts. And he presented me with a damn knife. Not like a knife is going to do anything, but he was really scared for us. Um, and he told us that a bear had come into his sort of mini courtyard and he's in the middle of nowhere. His is like a typical, you know, the typical sketch, the kids drawing book when you've got these pine trees and like these mountains and it's nighttime, got the moon there and just like a small little hut yeah. with sort of smoke coming out the chimney. His was like <laughs> that place. And he said that a bear walked right past his Tibetan Mastiff into his courtyard and started scratching at his steel door. And he, oh, man. yeah, and he locked himself in a cupboard and just stayed there till the bear went. And I was just like, that's Jeez. terrible. And, and we're in a tent. We've got we've not yeah. got no steel door protecting us from a bear. Um, and then that next <laughs> morning, from to scratch. exactly nothing. <laughs> that next morning, we saw fresh bear footprints. Literally walked along that same tri trial, maybe a couple of hours before we were there. So that yeah. was eerie. Yeah, yeah, that's. That's scary stuff. What about the wolves? Any so you got kind of basically tracked for a couple of days, stalked by wolves. Yeah. Any did you ever kind of come up close to them? Or did you ever see any in in the flesh? Or um, I always... did. I, I did. Yeah, I did. We were staying with locals probably about a, a week or two weeks before we were stalked by a, a pack of the, a different pack. Um, and I was staying with a Tibetan family, and they were sort of showing me their way of life, how they heard the yak. You know, their typical routine. Uh, of milking the yak, spreading the dung, you know, drying it out, using it for the fire. And 
with the yak, once we had herded them and brought them back down towards their white felt tent, their yurt or their gurt, there was a wolf that wandered down, just a lone wolf that came down the mountain. Uh, and we had to chase it off because it was getting too close to the yak. And anyway, the next morning, none of us woke up um, through the night, but the next morning, a yak's tail was missing. Uh, we didn't know which yak it was. We just saw a tail, just loose, bleeding oh. on the floor. And we were like, it must have, must have been the wolf that came back for more. But, wow. Um, and just bit the tail off and then and then maybe got a kick in the face. for Probably that. And then yeah. Legged it. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's wild. That is wild. Are there any more animal encounters then before we move on? Wild any yak. Any others that... Wild yak were actually... <laughs> wild yak. Yeah, they were, they were maybe one of the most intimidating. I didn't think they yeah. were because I remember my guides being fearful and I was like, what? They're just big cows. You know what you're scared of? But, you know, once they explained it properly to me, I was like, oh, it's in mating yeah. season it is. And kind of like the, the males will pair up and go wandering around the, the Tibetan plateau and they are big. They are massive, furry as well I and know. aggressive because yeah. it was mating season that we were there. Uh, and they, you know, they scare off bears. They'll run at bears and bears will run away, you know. Um, yeah. And they've been known to just randomly rock up and, and kill the wild horses as well. And so we were worried because we had cast a choice the horse. Um, and I remember one morning they got too close for comfort. But we had the Chinese firecrackers with us to scare off bears, wolves, snow mm. leopards, mastiffs, and in this case, wild yak. And yeah, I remember just 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I think it was, they got really close and we set off the Chinese firecrackers and they went running. But ultimately, yeah. they were trying to get close to Castor and they would have just shredded him. Um, That's but, crazy. Yeah, they can be really aggressive. To be fair, cows are scarier than you're giving them credit for and yeah. more dangerous. So I'll just, I'm just going to stand up for cows for a minute. Just put that out there. Um, yeah. You know. yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> these yaks sound like something in between cows and rhinoceros. Yeah, um, I'll tell you what they are. <laughs> yes. They are big and they are strong. They're big ass. <laughs> you don't, don't want to get in between them. <laughs> so I'm going to move on from animals now with, with deep regret. I mean, I love talking about animals. No, but go for it. Tell me, um, so your best slash worst slash craziest, weirdest, whatever, food uh, and drink. Ooh. Let's start with food and drink. Best, worst, weirdest. Oh, weirdest. I'll go straight to weirdest, I think, because one stands out straight away. And that is maybe <laughs> the Pasha worm found in Pansihua in uh, Sichuan province in south of China. And they've got, they're kind of like these big um, fat centipedes mm. and they burrow in the Yangtze River and you've got to lift up the rocks to search for them. And it's a delicacy because they'll collect a load, they'll fry it and they'll actually um, put it on rice and include it in meals, but you can eat it raw as well. You know, you've got to twist its head off, pull its guts out, mm. pop it in your mouth where it will curl up and start wriggling. And I remember doing that, eating it raw you know, there's this explosion of pus and blood and it's a little bit salty. You've got to keep chewing. And I remember whilst I was chewing, uh, one of the local guys looked at me and he said, make sure it's fully chewed because if it's not and you swallow it, it's going to grip to your throat and stop crawling oh. back up. Oh, man. And I just remember thinking, <laughs> I'm just going to keep chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing. <laughs> and that was... If somebody said that to me, I'd never stop oh, chewing. It'd be yeah, I was like that. <laughs> yeah, I think powder. He, yeah, I think he came up, probably tapped me on the shoulder, like, yeah, you can swallow now. <laughs> like, I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah. But um, there's been that. There's been tarantula, snake, scorpion, um, squirrel. Squirrel was the, with the Burmese Hill Tribe. We, we hunted squirrel. Um, tasted pretty good. It's been a lot actually that we've eaten, and then the typical, yeah. typical stuff like in um, Bangkok when you actually can try the crickets, the cockroach, the maggot, the bamboo worm, etc. So I've eaten a lot in the wild and a lot, yeah, just like because it's the the delicacies. And the best I've had, I've had so many, so many nice dishes. Yeah, see, it's, it's such an array. You're very qualified to speak on this. You know, this is no pressure here. Like this is. A... <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of grim ones there for you but some of the nice ones are all the way through china really one of my favorite was the the, the typical hot pot um famous in Chongqing. you know it's just just water and oil just boiled and they throw anything into it you've got all of your spices it could be very spicy all of your meats mm. uh, all of your veg and then you just pick it out and it's like this big pot in the middle of the table it's very social way of eating as well and but I came across so many good foods in China. I think China had maybe the most diversity of food. Yeah. 
Um, but Madagascar as well, you know, they would have something simple like your, your rice and pork, yet they would spice it up in their own way that would make it incredibly nice. Uh, Mongolia was a little bit more bland, but it's an extreme country. You know, it's cold, it's dry, it's not much grows there. I think the only veg to grow there is potato and carrots. And so yeah. there's just high carbs, high calorie food. They're a thick, heavier set, you know, to last the extreme conditions that Mongolia throws at them. Yeah, wow. Um, what about the best, worst and weirdest, if you want? Like kind of answer any of those or all of them or whatever you want to do with it. But best, worst, weirdest uh, experience, I guess. Oh, oof, best. I cannot answer a best. I don't think. I, <laughs> yeah, that's just a been, tough one. Oh, yeah, there's just been so many so many great experiences we can preface it with one of the and one of the if you want one of the best one of the worst one of the uh weirdest. yeah <laughs> okay yeah one of the best maybe um i'm gonna keep it generic i think is you know the the people that i've met across the way um in different ways you know people who have just accepted me and allowed me into their guru and stay the night when i am feeling fearful or vulnerable if there's wolves or if there's bears or if it's minus 20 there's no great yeah. greater highlight than just being in the absolute wilderness seeing a hut and then like being curious you know will they be hospitable will they not and then when they are friendly and they are making you food and it's warm and they're giving you drink and you're inside and it's minus 20 outside and you don't need to set up your tent Oh, there's just some something so warming about that, you know. Um, yeah, for sure. So I would say it it's the local encounters or something that I get from the wild. Uh, the weirdest encounter. Something weird happened in Madagascar. Um, you know, I remember there's a bit of a story, but I remember in Madagascar that you know they believe in witches and, and bad spirits and all that. And, I remember we rocked up to this community randomly in the middle of the jungle. It wasn't even on the map. We didn't even expect to um, come across anything because there was just nothing up there. But we did. It was a small community of people. And, you know, they said, uh, you can stay here the night. So they gave us like an empty wooden hut with lots of cracks in. The roof wasn't solid. But we stayed in, in that. There was four of us. There was me, Max, my guide, Suzanne, my photographer, who joined me for, for a couple of weeks, and her porter, who was Malagasy. And I was carrying Gertrude, of course, and I'm sure you know about the story of Gertrude. In order to summit the highest mountain in Madagascar, you must carry yourself a white chicken, and that protects you from the bad spirits and witches. And, you know, as you know, I'm all about respecting the culture. So I took myself a white chicken. I, I called it Gertrude. He was with me for a good two and a half weeks. I fed him. He became fully domesticated. He would like sleep next to me on my tent. And anyway, this night he, <laughs> he slept next to Max. And they kept banging on about witches and shit that night. Um, and it was Max sleeping, then Suzanne next to him, then me, and then Lever. And then Gertrude was over near Max. And I remember that night just having a really bad dream. And my version is I had a bad dream. You know, I woke up and I saw Max coming back into the hut with my machete. And I remember thinking, you know, well, I said, you're right, mate. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah no, I'm fine go back to sleep his version he woke up that night and i was convulsing uh suzanne was convulsing and lever were, were all shaking and i asked them if they had bad dreams and they also had a really bad dream last night they had nightmares i was like that's so weird and the max said that he was actually uh he woke up that that night was looking at us, us three convulsing looked towards the door and there was a silhouette of someone stood outside the door um, and then he shouted at this thing on the other side of the door and then picked up his machete, ran outside. He heard a giggle or like a, like a, like a noise from this, what he called a, a lady. And it started to run. And, and Max is, you know, he's a young, he's a fit guy and he, he runs at a hell of a speed and he was running. And as soon as this thing entered the jungle, it just kind of vanished. And then he came back wow. and me lever. And Suzanne, he said, now stop convulsing. And I actually woke up and asked him if he was okay. And I was like, okay, that's random. You know, what are you suggesting? What are you saying? And he, of course, I don't believe in this stuff, but he was straight up saying that was a that was a witch. That was a witch that he had to run after. And I was like, well, why weren't you convulsing? If that was a witch, why didn't she put you under a little spell? 
And then he said, that's because Gertrude was sleeping beside me and witches are too scared to get too close to Gertrude, uh, to, to chickens. And it was just such a weird, oh, okay. <laughs> like, because it was like, that community is not even supposed to be there. We're in the middle of this forest. It's a full moon. And you can just see, yeah, you kind of know what he means with a silhouette. It was bright outside because of the moon, but it was dark. It was in the mountains. You know, he had Gertrude on his side. The next morning, all of the locals were like acting like it's normal and started sharing their experiences of witches. And me and Suzanne, <laughs> looking at each other, slightly weirded out and freaked out. And we're like, what is going on? So that was, um, that was wow. maybe one of the strangest because they yeah. were just so in belief. They looked like, it was like me and Suzanne were the weirdest ones for thinking logical. And because- What did you think had happened? Them, I don't know what happened. I, I had honestly no idea because all as I remember was seeing him walking in with a machete. With a machete. You know, he was out of You breath. must have reflected on it a lot, right? You must have thought have. through the whole thing like after and been, I like, have. trying to figure it out. Be, and even me and Suzanne, Suzanne got to a point where she, she actually stopped sleeping in her own tent um she was just she was freaked out fully freaked out by all of it and we were in mm. a place where you don't really come across people and you know you look at that where we were and it is a random community that hasn't really been found it's not marked on any gps or map i don't know if it is today but when when we were there in in 2015 it, it wasn't um and so it was just an all-round weird experience and it would kind of made me yeah. think that, okay, just take my sort of logical sort of scientific thinking out of it and put myself in their footsteps. And then I start to think that, you know, that this tradition must be hundreds of years old with the chicken, you know? And, and why were they also believing in, in witches or bad mm. spirits or, you know, and if we were coming across stuff that hasn't been found before, we came across all sorts of endemic plant life and wildlife along the way you know yeah. i don't know it was just it was just a weird weird situation that when i do put myself out of mine and into their shoes it's fascinating and i like to think you know mm. who knows but, well i i'm very convinced that we don't know everything yeah I'm very convinced exactly. that the mainstream views on topics like this don't know everything yeah. there's no way we can and we'll, i don't even know if there's any way we'd ever be able to prove yeah. scientifically th yeah. things like that so as far I wouldn't mess with I wouldn't mess with it if if I went out there and they're telling me there's like ghosts out there or something or spirits I, I'd be uh, you know I would not feel great about that I, I don't necessarily know if I would believe it yeah you know just like you said I don't know I would have done the chicken thing probably to I, I don't know how I would have felt about that but that's 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 weird that's a that's, surreal that's experience that's different isn't it yeah and it's just the way it all looks, sort of added up and everything that mm. I said they had an answer to yeah and i was just like wow they've really sort of and there was other stories that people were saying that was similar it was obviously translated to us because they are they didn't yeah. it was only max my guide he could speak english um yeah i just remember me and suzanne just just taking a moment of being like that's pretty freaky isn't it and i was there saying are you like are you 100 percent sure were you having nightmares last night and she was like yeah i can't remember the nightmares but i remember having or being freaked out and the same with yeah. Neva the other guide and i was just like what yeah and that's definitely freaky it's weird. and you've got to remember like you said they've been, they've had these these beliefs for hundreds maybe longer maybe thousands of years and and what you need to remember as well like what we need to remember as well is that pretty much i think every country on earth or every you know there's always um civilizations tribes whatever it's going to be old uh, cultures with these beliefs that probably if i had the time and energy to go in and like find do the research and compare mm. all of them closely yeah i bet there's loads of similarities i bet there's countries on the other side of the world to that that say the same kind of story yeah. of like oh you need to take this this duck or this chicken or whatever yeah with you and, yeah and like there's spirit scary stuff but it's just so far beyond it, what we know yeah. i guess it's just fun to speculate yeah about. and i That's, love that. thanks for sharing that yeah no problem and i, I do love that i love that um that part of traveling you know just because it is, mm. it is different. You get a glimpse into, you know, a different world where they really believe in something that you in your country don't believe in. You know, and I, I, that's just a great thing. And you, you should never dismiss it. You should, you should go with an open yeah. mind, and you don't have to fully believe it, but you know, embrace it and, and think about it. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because unless you can prove something 100% didn't, you know, is is not happening, which you can't. Yeah. You can't prove that 100%. So yeah. yeah, you have to stay, like you say, open-minded and and interested and yeah, 
just open to yeah. it it's fascinating though yeah, exactly cool story yeah cool story. No, um so look, i'm conscious of the time i don't want to keep you too long let's i did want to ask you a little bit about like your whole thing on the joe rogan and and what that was like at the time and how that came about yeah I really, man that was i think we, we might have to cut it a little bit but let's just have like one or two minutes literally yeah just sure. how did that first come about did he like call you and he's like yo ash or are you getting a dm from somebody connected to him or how how it was what's the process yeah so that was when i completed the yangtze it hit global media quite hard it was like bbc world news it was heavy here in the uk with the one show good morning britain uh, and it hit fox news and, and other platforms in the us uh so i'm guessing he saw something in the US media. Um, and anyway, I had a PR team for when I got back from the Yangtze who were working with me for a month. And, you know, their mm. job were to, to get it out there as far as possible. And they had sent a message to the website um, of Joe Rogan's and, and actually got a response. They weren't expecting anything, but they got a response. And uh, it was a case of one of Joe's assistants uh, or one of his agents saying that Joe loves the story um, and would love us to to be on the show. And I think we got the email back in mid December or towards the end of December. And it was a case of, can you fly out to LA within the next two weeks? And it was like, Whoa, yeah, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm guessing everything is paid for, right? I'm guessing flights and no, it, no, it thing. wasn't. Actually. Oh no, no. It was a case oh, of be here at this uh, date. I guess too fast. Yeah, yeah. No, I think with his show, because it's such a big reach, I don't think he will, He'll cover, he won't yeah. cover any costs or anything yeah. Um, yeah because he's you know it wow gets out there on a on a huge level doesn't it so yeah very much yeah it's huge mm. uh, especially right now obviously with like the the controversy and things like that yeah um, yeah, yeah 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 i've not yeah, watched that wild. latest one well not the latest one but the one with um dr mccullough is it uh, yeah, I don't think I haven't seen. I'm not a watched few it. Recently, no. actually. I'm a bit out of the loop yeah, as well. So yeah. unfortunately, we won't be able to have an explosively controversial discussion about it. But uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll leave that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just thought I'd check with you how it happened. I just thought it was interesting whether you got like a DM off Joe, like while you're in the, the oh, yeah. China or yeah. How it was, but that's yeah, cool. Yeah. And it was a good experience, right? You enjoyed it, I guess. It was and great. Was fun. Yeah, I loved it. Uh, even beforehand, you know, showing around his his man cave. It's so cool inside. Um, everyone yeah. there that I work with, I bumped into Joey Diaz as well. Joey Diaz came oh, yeah. out just oh, as I, I was going in. You did, yeah, because I noticed this. I, I was looking at the episode list. You were after Joey Diaz and one before. You're in your sandwich, Robert Downey Jr. and Joey Diaz, right? That's it, yeah. What a sandwich. Yeah, it's such a it's good awesome, sandwich. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so funny because my, so my mate is a, is a huge sort of fanboy of Joe Rogan and he flew out with me. Um, and I, I watch his, his podcast. I listened to a few of them out on the Yangtze, but I had never yeah. heard, I know Joey Diaz, but I'd never heard one of the podcasts with Joey Diaz. And anyway, Joey comes out of the room, the room that I'm about to go in the actual studio where they film it. Uh, and straight away he was like, Hey, Ash, you know, shook my hand. He was like, good luck. And my mates in the green room, he's looking from a distance. And then afterwards he was like, he was grabbing his head saying that was the most <laughs> wasted handshake ever because he wanted to shake his hand and he was just like, do you even know who Joey, Joey Diaz is? I was like, yes, I do know. I do know. I've just not seen his podcast. But that was just funny how he was like, that's so wasted on you. <laughs> but no, it was really cool. cool. And he was, you know, just as cool off podcast as he is on. And then he shot me a message yeah. on Insta. I think it was only like a couple of days later uh, where he'd come out uh, of a restaurant with his wife and he met a group of guys who were raving about my episode with him and mm, so that was cool nice. that he shared that with me and i was like oh yeah that's so cool yeah um, that is cool that's nice good experience <laughs> joey diaz is wild as well joey diaz is like such an outlandish character ludicrous yeah character. he seems just, very it's, sort of it just seems like so much fun like, yeah. Uh, yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> It's just so like crazy stories for like every occasion. Mm. He seems like he's got as many stories as you, even though he definitely has not walked like around the world <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it's oh. just just he, pure he's, entertainment. He's like, a, um, yeah, like one of those original gangsters, isn't he? You can just tell that he has got <laughs> exactly. a lot to talk about, a lot to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um right ash just to let let's just try try and get this over the finish line i'm going to ask you just if you want to talk about it we don't have to go into it sure just what you're up to now and what your kind of plans are for the the future really. yeah sure um, uh yeah you know I, I feel like i'm still just getting started i made some exciting new yeah. developments the team's always grown and expanded we're working on a project that 
it keeps getting pushed back, the announcement. So I've been saying it for a good few months that I should be able to announce within the next month or two, fingers crossed. But this is a, a cool project. It is for TV as well. Um, and yeah, I can't, and I can't wait to, not just yet, not just yet. Soon I should be able to yeah talk more about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to get it, get it out there and, and to get myself out there. Yeah, so it should be. Can we can we name a continent? Can we name which continent you're going to? <laughs> no, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I respect that. I respect. That. I try. I try. You got to try. Uh, you got to. So try. big plans, basically, big plans, big and, plans. and yeah, soon, soon, hopefully, big plans hopefully. and soon. Yeah, yeah. It's been a awesome. nightmare trying to keep it to myself because I really want to talk about it. <laughs> no worries um and so then look, look, to finally get this over then i've got the, the the final thing for you and it's just if you want to send a message to anybody watching or listening it can be anything at all it can be inspirational it can be words of encouragement or it can be something totally different it doesn't have to be any of that um whatever you want to say yeah no i would uh you know i'd just say hope they've hope they've enjoyed the show um and you know i'd probably i'd probably also tie in with the message that uh because you've got to be very careful with sort of what you talk and how you talk about things. And I think sometimes I'll often forget in the hype of a podcast because I'm having so much fun and getting lots of questions that I forget to give, you know, a good few mentions as to, you know, how the story connects and how I look at the bigger picture, you know? So whilst I've been doing a lot of these expeditions, um, it's easy to forget about sort of the courses that I've been working for, you know, in Mongolia, I was raising funds for the Red Cross. I was um, raising awareness about climate change and the effects that has on, on the nomadic way of life. Madagascar, again, I was raising awareness for the Lima Network Conservation and all of the good work they're doing to protect and preserve all of the unique biodiversity on the island. And then with China, very similar, you know, partnered with the WWF um, to help shout about and raise more awareness on the climate impact out there as well and you know so hopefully the the viewers don't see it as just about one man and his sort of mission and hopefully can can see a bigger bigger picture there but also that there's takeaways in a relatable way you know not that only sounding like i'm encouraging you to go to the jungle and hack through or encouraging you to go to the desert but you know maybe there's some methods there that hopefully your audience picks up on for, for the Gobi yeah. Desert, it could be breaking your goals down. You know, that helped to save my life, but that can also help for when you're planning a goal, when you're trying to smash out a dissertations for your university, you know, manage your expectations, break it down into little sections. Um, and, you know, understand that no matter what we work to or towards in life, we can't always be motivated, but we can be disciplined. Uh, and so hopefully there's some relatable takeaway messages there as well. And, you know, yeah, keep working hard, keep grinding, stay resilient. and. Uh, yeah keep going awesome great message great message very very all-encompassing i love that mm. thank you ash this was this was a lot of fun this was this yeah was it was great awesome. Ben. yeah uh, no loved it you, you have so many stories and <laughs> I mean, we might have to do this again at some point to try and scratch the surface a little bit more to get some of these stories because I can just feel that we had like what one percent of uh, of your stories. There's Not a even. lot, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this was we'll wicked, and and I I wish you all the best for your next expedition and, that. and with everything else. Yeah, I'll keep Thank you posted, you, and uh, I'll join on again when uh, when I'm back. We'll do another one. Awesome. Thanks, Ash. Cheers, Take care, buddy. Thanks. See you now. Thanks for listening to the episode with Ash Dykes. I echo what Ash said. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please check both Ash and us out via the links in the description and please subscribe. Be nice, be happy, be cool.